a couple, three, four, five times a year at different tracks and we'll test different compounds to try to find what the best compound portfolio is for each year of racing. A, uh, it takes an hour and a half to make one of these tires. One of these confidential tires that we use at Le Mans or American Le Mans series it takes an hour and a half to produce. So they're, they're expensive, not only in, in, in time to manufacture, but also in the number of ingredients. We have a lot of very special ingredients in the tire. There's over 150 different ingredients in a race tire. Some accomplishments in the last 10 years, we've made 35% increase in distance covered by a set of tires and we're using 25% fewer tires today than we were uh, just over the past five years. Anybody know how hot a race tire is? It's something I always tell people that, that come into the pits. These, these race tires are optimum uh, temperature. It's not too different from what, what I find on the ZR1 for the PS2s and PS Cups. It's, uh, it's 100 degrees centigrade or boiling temperature of water. So 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That's where you get the maximum grip, and these tires work the best. What makes that incredible to, to think about is you have a tire, you have rubber at over 200 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's still stiff enough to hold a car going 150, 60 miles an hour around a corner. Yes, sir? That, I'm, I'm talking racetrack, like a driver's education program or club racing. You know, it'd be a max handling situation when you're going out on the track and trying to drive for, for time. So it, ta it takes some training. Or you could do a burnout right in front of your driveway. You know, you do a burnout and it's so high so you get it. And you can get it, you know, but a ZR1 with 638 horsepower, you can get up that high temperature real easy. That's where all the smoke is coming from because it's actually over 212 <laughs> degrees. Uh, vertical load, we can have up to 2,000 pounds of vertical load depending on bumps in the road and, and aerodynamics and downforce plays a big role. The, the, the Pratt & Miller GT Racing Corvette weighs about 2,600 pounds. So, you know, we can actually have 8,000 pounds vertically loaded on that tire. And, and then the flexing, flex number of rotations of a tire, that's a big, big effect on tire endurance. So, very highly fatigue-related uh, engineering problem here. Next slide. Lee? Yes. There's been some talk recently that some of the stellar lights run in this country are like burnout for the legal hearing area. I didn't hear you real good. Can you say that again? There's been some talk recently that some of our stellar lights run in the legal hearing area. Ah, I see. Some, the question was that some people, some of our government officials, right, want to make burnouts <laughs> illegal. I have to, yeah, I'm, I, I haven't heard anything about that in South Carolina yet. <laughs> yes, sir, I thought so. Yes, sir. What about tire pressure to get the tires up to that working temperature? How do you, what, what about, I realize it, it, there's a lot of variables involved, temp you know, ambient temperature, track temperature, and so forth. But just generally, what kind of, of um, cold tire pressure are you working with to make sure that the tire does get to 212? Okay, the, the question was, is what kind of cold pressure do you want to work with to get uh, your the operating temperature at, at optimum? Uh, temperature for grip and it, it, as you said sir it's very dependent on the driver the surface condition of the road or a racetrack uh, that you're working with um, I know the aggregate used in road surfaces here in Kentucky is way different than what we use in South Carolina our, our, our roads Michelin is located in South Carolina because of the wear rate because our roads are such high grip that tires wear out faster than anywhere else in the United States, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, from the granite. And it's really high grip surface. Now we're talking about for track driving. Yes, yes sir. So when you go, go to tracks like Road Atlanta, you usually can, you, because there's such high grip and you have such high friction, 
you can start with lower pressures because you don't want your tires to become overpressured because if you have a lot of friction, a lot of grip, you work the tires really hard and they can generate a lot of heat and all of a sudden you find your the optimum for Corvettes is usually operating hot pressure is street Corvettes is around 35 PSI. Um, now, if, if you're on a track in, at Road Atlanta, you're, you might, after a couple laps, if you're driving very aggressively, pushing the car, you might be up at 40 PSI, 42 PSI, and that's not where you want to be. So what I, I suggest to people at Road Atlanta is to, to run at 26 PSI. Start out at 26 PSI. And, you know, try to, you have to, you have to do it and try it to find out, depending on the vehicle setup, your driving style, and the track that you're at. Now, if you go to a track in a different area, like like the National Corvette School in Spring Mountain, you know you have a different grip level of the track there, and you have to run and and uh, try some things. I, I work with Ron Fellows a lot at, at Spring Mountains about track pressure. So if you see me afterwards, we can talk specifically about. If you give me some specific tracks, I might be able to give you some setup pointers. Thank you. Let's see. Tire transfer from the track, again, we talked a lot about this. Again, the, the rubber, this is a cutaway of one of our, this is the PS2 of the ZR1. So the tread rubber here, all the internal construction, the belts, not only the materials of the belts, but also the angles that, that we uh, apply those belts in. You have three belts in the tire. You have a, a Kevlar belt that runs at zero degrees on the top. Then you, underneath that, you have a two steel belt surface. Carcass cord is, is another thing that transfers over. Um, as well as the shape of the mold, the crown of the mold, whether it's round or flat, those things all transfer over because they affect the contact patch in the lower right angle there. One thing about the contact patches is, I always look for an analogy to talk about contact patches, but there can be so many different optimizations of a contact patch. It's kind of like very personal pre preference same thing as wine connoisseurs, more appropriate to me would be barbecue. You know, red sauce, yellow sauce, vinegar sauce. There's so many different ways to set up a contact patch for a, to optimize braking, to optimize cornering. And what our job is, is to try to optimize it for everything, which doesn't make it easy, but we're, we're trying to optimize those contact patches for everything. And that's what you see with the Pilot Sport Cup that's on the current ZR1. The other, the other on the, if you go back to the other slide there, that one of the things that transfers from racing to us in the street tire development is just the way we analyze, the way we study our tires. Jeff is expert at this back here, if you want to ask him any questions afterwards. Um, this is cornering force with, with engines. This is cornering for, force versus slip angle for tires, a front and rear tires. With engines, you always look at horsepower versus RPM. You look at spring rates or damping rates for your sh shock absorbers or your chassis sy systems. Here with the um, tires, we're always looking at coring force versus slip angle. And, and these, the red curves there are the ZR1 PS2s. The top one is the amount of coring force you get out of the rear tire. The bottom one is the amount of coring force you get out of the front tire. And what's so incredible about these curves is the bottom red curve and it's, it's kind of right in, it's equal to the, the green and blue curves. Those, those are older generation Dodge Viper tires. And they're also the rear tires of the Dodge Viper. So you see it, the cornering power of a ZR1 front tire is equal, or actually sometimes better than the cornering power of a old Dodge Viper rear tire. So that shows the progress that's been made and, and how we try to grade ourselves and keep on pushing the envelope. Okay. Okay, next group. Okay, here we're going to talk about development of the tire. It, it all, there's a lot of computer modeling because you can, yes sir. Use this one? Okay, what I was wondering about the sidewall. You mentioned uh, some steel belting you were using. Yes. Are you planning on using any Kevlar? Yes, well, let me, let me, um, I'll tell you what. Um, I've got another tire cut that comes up here, a cutaway, and I'm going to point out real specifically all those parts. I don't know, Jeff, do you, is there a light pointer in the room maybe, if you might be able to find one? 
Okay, this is the conception of, of a tire design. This is our PS Cup. And this is one of, the, one of the biggest challenges for me personally is, is I, I was trained in classical engineering using a drafting board, a pencil, and paper. And now I have to know how to run three-dimensional graphics programs and it blows my mind <laughs> trying to, to draw these things. But, but, but I'll, I'll put together all the parts of a tire in a computer, 3D, just like you see with aero, aero aircraft companies and, and everybody else in today's modern world because there's so much information there and it's all transferred automatically into a manufacturing system with, that builds prototypes or production tires with robots. Next slide, Stephanie. Once I create a, a, a 3D um, <coughs> graphics model of the tire, then we start to do our analysis, our mathematical analysis. So we have all these models that we look at things in the tire, like the overall deflection. You see that's a, that's a, a zero one front tire. They have all the deflection of a, a, a 3D model of the tire. Then we can look specifically at what do the stresses and strains look like in the contact patch. That's really important for grip, for wear, hydroplaning, wet grip, uh, endurance of the rubber. Uh, so we have a lot of knowledge based on what our model predicts that we know how to optimize a tire before we ever build, ever build the first tire. So, so we know a lot of where we're going just based on these mathematical models to, uh, to understand how to, where to start. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time we, we build a tire. Next slide. Grip. Everybody knows how grip works, right? That's one of, one of the magic boxes in tire design that we're always playing in. But right, I just wanted to show this. This is a very simplified explanation of, of tire grip. But if you look at things microscopically, this is really what's going on with the tire. Because they're not Velcro. You know, Velcro is something else. That's a mechanical thing that the astronauts invented in the Saturn programs that works really well for holding tools up on the wall. But, but this is the way rubber works. There's two mechanisms in grip. Um, one is called adhesion, and that is the, um, the attractions of molecules in the asphalt or concrete to the molecules in the rubber. And when I talk to you guys about the temperature of this, the operating temperature of rubber, the hotter the rubber is, the better it sticks. It starts to stick almost like duct tape. You know, it sticks really well when it's really warm. So you have that aspect of grip. The other aspect of grip is real physical and it's easier to understand. And it's the mechanical aspect, the fact that you have deformation into the rubber, which is another thing that increases when the rubber temperature gets higher. You have deformation into the rubber and that causes a reaction and to be able to transmit force laterally back and forth. Next slide. So, so again, more and more analysis. We have really a, a blend of two worlds, worlds, the chemical or rubber design along with the mechanical world. I come from a mechanical engineering background. But you know, again, we'll look at the way the contact package changes from rolling straight ahead to cornering. Here's your straight on, straight ahead contact patch cornering. Here's a here's a tire, and it happens to be a, a run flat tire, but it shows how the tire deforms when it corners. We look at all the stresses and strains in the sidewall. We can also predict temperature. You know, just using mathematical models, we can predict the temperature in the contact patch, which you can imagine that gives us a a big step up in understanding the grip level. And again, we're always analyzing the contact patch to find a specific preference for uh, development goals. Stephanie. Here's, here's where Jeff World's, Jeff's world comes in. This is um, vehicle dynamics. And not only do we write big, long, complicated mathematical formulas for the tires themselves, we also write models for your vehicle. And a vehicle is a very complicated thing. The, the, the current generation Corvette is what, C6 is way different than a C4. And everybody in this room probably knows, is, remembers C4s, remember how they ride compared to the C6 now. And there's, there, these are very complicated models. What we try to do is to input tire model data into a vehicle model data and out 
put what is the lap time difference? Do, do we make with this tire design, do we get to do we improve the lap time difference? Or we use those same things for comfort. Do we improve the noise, vibration, harshness, the ride feel of the tire? Next slide. This is um, this uh, back one more. This is um, this is our track, our wet handling track in, in Lawrence, South Carolina. And this is uh, uh, we we actually we put devices that measure accelerations in the car and, get, and measure trajectory and lap time. And you can see here are some tires that, that we optimize for wet handling. And you see that we're able to have higher lateral accelerations. The farther out, the better in this graph. And you see our competitors' tires are all in here, but the Michelin tires that were optimized, you know, you're able to drive faster. The, uh, Chris, in his presentation on the Callaway Corvette, mentioned the hydroplaning issue with uh, Corvette tires or the hydroplane situation. A competitor tire might have hydroplane at 62, 65 miles per hour. And one of the things he noticed with the Michelin tires, it didn't hydroplane until 75 miles an hour. Well, doing some of this work, we, we understand that. That's how we validate our product before we bring it out to you all in the field. Next slide. This, this is, I'm not sure if any, I'm from South Carolina, but I'm a big ski race fan. And when we think about the forces that play on a car, and the, the a tire is very complicated, the vehicle is very complicated, but if we think of, there's a lot of other sports and activities that we do that also have the same basic principle. That is, you want to be the quickest down the track. You want to be the fastest, the most maneuverable, and get to the bottom. And I thought one of the most simplest engineering diagrams and one of the most amazing performance levels is a downhill skier, a giant slalom skier. The, the, women, um, the women will pull about two and a half G's and the men pull about three G's. So you have guys like Herman Meyer, uh, Bodie Miller, those guys are pulling three G's of acceleration when they go around the gates. The Corvette, the racing Corvettes are pulling one and a half to two G's of acceleration. But I thought one of the, this is a great picture showing the dynamicism of, of racing and, and Liz, Lynn, Lindsey Vaughn winning the gold medal in one of her races in the Olympics. And you know, she is almost three G's going around this corner. The, the forces that are acting here are very simple, body force and ski force. This is the same type of things that we try to do for in the competition as well as the street tire development for uh, Corvette. And that really, really shows a, a, the, the forces that play in a simple manner that we try to optimize and balance so that you end up going through the, the course the fastest and getting to the bottom and win. Next slide. Next, please. The next thing I want to do is talk about specific tires that are, that are on your cars. Um, Again, we talked about race tires the con and then the commercial racing slicks. <coughs> then the next in the performance hierarchy is the Pilot Sport Cup. Pilot Super Sport. We have a, also another summer tire, Pilot Sport 2 ZP tires. And then we have an all season tire, Pilot Sport All Season Plus ZP. And I'm, I'm going to break these down and show you the components in each one of the tires. Next slide. But first, you notice for Corvette, most of the stuff is ZP, or it's run flat tires. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about why run flat. And ZP equals zero pressure equals run flat. One of the not uh, very notable facts in the history of Corvette is Corvette was the first mainstream sports car or mainstream vehicle to pioneer run flats. And that was with the C4 in 1995. They were the first... <coughs> large-scale application of run-flat tires. Advantage is why, why does Corvette do this? They can design the vehicle different. They don't have to design around a spare tire in the trunk. Um, there's mass savings, there's convenience, and there's safety and security. So all these things are very important. Also, run-flat tires tend to be a little bit better for handling, too, so that's another important aspect that we apply for Corvette. And the technology has dramatically improved and over the last, since the mid 90s. There's a huge difference in run flat tires today and then. This is a favorite picture of my grandmother. So this is in Milwaukee in the 1930s. 
and she was working on flat tires and now her grandson in 2012 is doing it all in the computer and mathematically. I've heard that after you've had a zero pressure event with one of these tires, uh, any zero pressure tire and get it repaired that you lose certain of its uh, characteristics or its durability from that point forward or perhaps speed rated. I'm just curious as to what effect does it have in real life when you actually have a flat tire on a zero pressure tire and repair it? That's a, a great question, sir. Thank you. The, um, you can see that in this model here. See this red zone right there? That is rubber that is working very hard to hold up your weight and the weight of the vehicle. That's high stress, high strain. Uh, that can eventually cause rubber to break down in that zone right there. Um, but Michelin and, and General Motors for, for Corvette, the distance recommended to drive a run flat tire is not over 50 miles. I'm pretty sure is what this, the current recommendation is. Previously they said 100 miles. When the C, during the C4 generation, they'd say 200 miles. But so it depends. You don't want to drive your, run fl your tire flat for 8,500 miles. And I have done that <laughs> before with some run flat tires at slow speeds. And, and you can, you know, it's possible, but it's not, not what the, the intent is. The intent is uh, temporary mobility to get to a place to fix it. If you drive your, your vehicle under 50 miles and you take it to a, a, a representative of Michelin and they follow Rubber Manufacturer Association tire inspection and repair guidelines, you can repair and use that tire at, at the speed rating. And that, what that means, translated real quickly, it means less than a quarter inch hole in the summit tread band. If you, you, have, you must dismount inspect, sand the inside down, put a, a solid blue patch, and you follow all the guidelines, that tire is just as good as, as a new tire. Thank you. Yes, sir. As long as you follow those guidelines, you can keep on going. However, if, if you have one flat, and you patch it, this next flat, you might have had a long nail in there, and that nail might have been scraping the sidewall, and, and that's why it's important to dismount and inspect, always, and follow the guidelines. But it's not limited by one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I was going to ask you this after a while, but since uh, you led into it, the question, uh, I lead a lot of Corvette caravans, over 17,000 miles last year. I've been a Michelin person since Michelin X is on Healy 106. Uh, this happened to me twice this year so far. We've been on the road. We picked up a uh, screw. Nobody would repair that tire. We went to three different facilities, and nobody would touch the car because it was a run flat. And I had to leave a person behind and have a tire shipped in and, and because nobody would touch it. That happened on the way to the Sebring 12 hour. It happened on another caravan last year. Both tires were less than a year old. Both tires had less than 5,000 miles. I then wrote to a major distributor, I call it a mail or catalog, catalog that everybody in here probably knows and uses. And I got a full page letter back from them that basically says, and what we were told at the dealerships was it is corporate policy that we will not fix a run flat. And the car was sitting right out there and they could see it. They wrote up the work order until the mechanic went out, looked at the tire, said it's a run flat. We won't touch it. My car was next to it, which had Michelin Pilot PS2 pneumatics. I said, well, why, why have pneumatics? Could you fix that? And, oh, we'll fix that. And so this is for us. I was going to talk to you later, but since it was let in, because it really concerns us, because we drive these cars, and if I'm in the middle of West Virginia, and this happened to be in Charlotte, North Carolina, and nobody would touch the tire. We then went to Panama, we went to uh, Pensacola, because we had no choice. The tire never went under 27 pounds of pressure, never went flat. And the third deal we there, the one we went to, was the same thing. We will not touch that tire or order the new one. 
and we have to leave the fellow behind. Okay, that's that's a, a very serious question. It's a good point that that touches everybody in this room that has a, a flat tire. I'll try to give a, a some advice, a good answer for that. Uh, the first one would be that if that if you can go to a, a, a General Motors Chevrolet Corvette dealer, they know what the what the guidelines are for repairing um, repairing run flat tires uh, because um, most of our competitors and Michelin that anybody that makes tires for Corvette makes them so they're repairable. Um, on the on the other the other problems that you've had is that I think there are other there are other companies out there that suggest that they don't repair run flat tires. Other car companies out there at this, but at the same time, they also suggest to their their owners not to repair standard tires either if they have a flat. And, and I'm speaking about German car companies, and there could be some some misunderstandings based on the difference in, in corporate policy from the OEM manufacturers. But Michelin stands behind the fact that you can repair our tires following standard guidelines. Um, I would also suggest that if, if you have that problem when you go into a dealer, and I, I know you, I think the best place to go for this is to go to a, a certified you know, Chevrolet dealer that sells Corvettes, and a lot of those guys do tire repair as well. The next thing is if you go to a, someone that's just a tire dealer, have them call the Michelin Consumer Relations tire line and ask that same question. And, and, and you know, if they need, maybe they feel better about doing the work and they, maybe they're not trained well enough. And they need, they need, to, they need to talk to the corporate. Yeah. Lee, maybe you can talk with him afterwards. We'll do that afterwards, but that, that's just advice, advice for all of you, please. Yes, sir.